Hi, everybody, and welcome. We're super excited to welcome you to, for, to the first episode of the 2022 Elephant We Don't See Diversity Dialogue that is presented by my office, which is the Prince George's County Office of Human Rights and the Prince George's County Memorial Library System with my wonderful friend, Michelle, uh, who represents the library system. The Elephant We Don't See Diversity Dialogue uh, is an opportunity where Michelle and I come together and we talk about books and we really try and talk about them, not so much as book reviews, but like, what did we learn? How can we look at what we read as a way to like basically be better people in the world. Like what, what did we learn about how we can engage more fully with others? Did we see ourselves reflected or did we see areas of weakness? And we just really try and talk openly and frankly. And um, we hope that by doing so, we create a space for you to feel safe talking openly and frankly, either with us in the chat, which you're always welcome to do, but also maybe as you go out into your neighborhood, as you meet friends or your neighbors or strangers that, you know, Michelle and I have shown you a way maybe to, to connect with people that you might not otherwise have had the opportunity to connect with. So we're very excited about 2022. I wanted to take a quick moment and kind of review what we've done with this series so far. Our first um, year that we did this was in 2020, the first year of the pandemic. We It sort of happened, our series sort of happened accidentally. The pandemic, it was one of the gifts of the pandemic, actually, that um, Michelle and I had some plans to work together in person about a book, and, and that led into our diversity dialogue. And that first year, we really studied a lot of books about race relations. And I think that laid a foundation for our work, um, honestly, uh, in, in you know my job, but also in our conversations together. Last year, we read a whole bunch of books from a variety of different viewpoints. And this year, our general focus is kind of like the what now, like how do we put this into practice, all these different things we've read and go out into the world and maybe be a little bit better. And you'll hear more about that later as we talk about upcoming books. But for tonight, we are gonna talk about Toni Morrison, wonderful collection. Uh, it's called The Source of Self-Regard, collection of speeches, essays, and musings, and it's it's an incredible work. So we're so happy you're with us tonight. Thank you very much for joining us again. We love seeing all of you. And Michelle, I have not seen you for like four months. How are you, buddy? I am hanging in there, Kyla. I'm hanging in there. And how about you? Uh, wow. Okay. Well, let's get right into it. Okay. <laughs> So I am doing, I'm doing well, you know, there's a lot of changes in, um, in our lives, actually. And I was saying, I'll just speak frankly to people listening, because I think I'm probably not alone in this. I'm experiencing a little bit of the existential dread of our times. Um, and I'm really glad to be meeting you tonight to talk about this. We don't have to talk about the existential dread. But one of the things that I'm happy about doing is just being with a friendly face and being able to chat with somebody and talk about, you know, some of these issues, you know. So thanks for being here. Yeah, I'm I'm excited about being back together. The um I just finished my I told you I was taking a course at Georgetown University. Um it is in their uh international leadership program and it was on diversity, equity and inclusion and one of the things that it really made me think about is how am I showing up in the world mm -hmm. and um and what that actually means um and so um i was in this this space that seems like things just are not getting any better mm -hmm. and um when i thought about what was happening um with tony morrison's the bluest eye um being banned in Missouri and it went through and now they're talking about um, banning it in Virginia and um the first thing that came to mind is cancel culture and erase critical race theory and um if kids don't go so what what I experienced in Prince George's County library system is when we went through diversity training, Many of the staff members said, I've never heard any of this. Mm -hmm. Never heard it. I never knew that, um, you know, how African Americans contributed. I've never heard about how indigenous people contributed. And um, it was an eye opener for them. And yet, there are so many people who are working to cancel culture. Um, or to erase critical race theory. And, and what that does, I mean, 
what our children miss because they could, could have such a rich education. And um, it bothers me that so much of what people need to know um, mm -hmm. is just not allowed to be taught. And so that's really made me think, how do I show up in the world? And really, um, when I recommended this, I had not read um, The Source of Self-Regard. And that was really the impetus for me selecting this. When we talked, it was really, I'm thinking this book was going to be um, how I show up in the world. What can I do to improve who I am as a person and um, make a difference in this world? What will my mark be on this in this world? And I'm going to be honest, when I started reading this thing, it was just kind of like, okay, it brought back so much that, I mean, this book is just packed with everything. And um, it's a compilation of um, essays, speeches, and meditations. Um, and um, it, you have to be in a different space. So I need to reread it because, uh, you know, Kyle and I, mm -hmm. I mean, we talked about um, how we read it and we read it for this program, but um, I need to go back and really read. I mean, I found myself, and I consider myself fairly educated, but there were times when I read a sentence and I had to go back and look up, did I really understand the meaning of this word? Um, there were times, and that's Toni Morrison. I mean, Toni Morrison is deep. She has always been deep. Um, and you walk away reading her material and even her fiction, you walk away reading her fiction and say, wow, um, there's so much in it. She packs a whole lot. And even in a two-page essay, she yeah, packs yeah. a lot in it. Um, but before we, we get into the book, I wanted to um, really share with those who might be listening, um, every time there is something um, uh, that happens in African-American um, in the African American community, um, or there's some advance in um, uh, that happens to advancement to Black people in general. One of Toni Morrison's books will be banned. I mean, Beloved has been banned. Um, the Bluest Eye has been banned, and so um, we just need to remember if one of her books has been banned, then something good is happening. That's how I'm taking that. Um, and I read an article that says, after the Black Lives Matter movement, after the 1619 Project, after the election of Barack Obama, any major moment in history where you see progress of people of color, Black people in particular, backlash will follow and Morrison's books tend to be targeted. Mm -hmm. Um, and it is, and it says um, it, it to be targeted because she is unrelenting in her belief that the particular experiences of black, black people are incredibly universal. Blackness is the center of the universe of her and for her readers and for her imagined reader. Mm -hmm. And that is inappropriate or inadequate or unreasonable or unimaginable for some people. And... Mm -hmm. um, you know, even the Texas prison system banned paradise because it said they said that it would incite a riot. Now, mm -hmm. Toni Morrison could get upset about that. But what she said is, well, how powerful is that? Mm -hmm. That a book that I wrote um, could tear up the whole place. And um, the... I think some writers, if their books are banned, um, do get to a point where, you know, well, should I continue writing? And, um, you know, going back to, well, then it must be some good trouble. And mm -hmm. so um, I am, this book, like I said, it, it unpacks a whole lot. It is heavy reading at some time, in some places. It's light reading in others. Um, it, it, it's hopeful in some places and then makes you think um, there's no hope. 
Um, because if there, there's one, I can't even remember what it is. I know I have the page marked. I have a million pieces of paper in this book. Um, but when it kind of goes through history and what some of our forefathers of the American culture, um, let either letters they wrote, uh, excerpts from letters they wrote or excerpts from speeches they made. Um, when we're going back to the 1600s, what was said, um, you know, that's when you realize, okay, and here we are in 2022 and nothing's changed. And so I really read, I mean, I really did choose this book to say, okay, how am I showing up in the world? I thought this was going to be the season of hope given the other titles we chose. And I'm hoping, I don't necessarily read the books before we recommend them. It's like, oh, it's a good book, let's read it. And I, if I have read it, I approach it with a new eye. And this was one of them, it's like, yeah, source of self-regard, yep. This is going to be healing. I'm not sure it did that for me, but I loved it. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I mean, we were talking and I'll, I'll say this again, that, you know, I don't, I was, it was an intellectually rigorous book. And what I said backstage to backstage to Michelle, I was like, you know, I'm not, I'm like no intellectual slouch, but this was pretty hard. So it may be that I, in fact, I am an intellectual slouch, but I would argue that really it's one of those books that, that it deserves so much time and it deserves so, and it needs, it requires so much time and so much thought. And I think you've said that, like, we need to go back and, and, you know, really, um, honor it with the time that it deserves. I was struck by so much in it. And one of the things, I mean, I, I so I did, I am every librarian's nightmare because I did this to my pages, okay? I underlined and I did this to my, so I'm, 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 to all my librarian friends, including Pam backstage for the library, who's doing all the, our tech support backstage. Thank you very much, Pam. I apologize for all of these dog-eared uh, pages, but I'll just say this, it's not a library book. Um, <laughs> But one of the the whole sections. So this this so for for those of you who haven't had a chance to read it yet, it's divided into sort of three major sections. So there's the foreigners' home, there's black matters, and there's God's language. And black matters opens up, and it and it and I was really interested in this because so much of the work that we do, and and we're in partnership with the library, and of course that's um, so much of that work, not all of it, but a lot of that work is about literature, it's about books, and so there is this part, and I'm going to paraphrase, I'm not going to read it because it's actually a, a substantial part of the section that looks at um, the canon uh, of American right. literature, which thankfully is changing, by changing very slowly. And it is uh, primarily white, primarily male. And when I say primarily white and male, it's probably at least 90% white and male together. And then, um, and wealthy. So it's a very limited um, view of what it means to be human. And so she addresses this in this chapter uh, or in this section. And one of the things that she talks about is that in order to have, oh gosh, I probably do need to paraphrase it, but, or to read it, because I don't think I'm going to paraphrase it well, but I'm hoping you, you remember this section, Michelle, and you can help me with this. Which is, I, have, I have the pen and um, I have it highlighted, but go ahead. So yeah, but that essentially that, that when, when we're writing, um, from this point of view, this white male point of view that excludes blackness or writes as if writes from some point of view where where the foundation of America doesn't exist, which is the foundational element of slavery, um, that what she is saying is that that is there. And it made me think of um, the the image, like what's in the in the space that you that's not highlighted. So like those um, uh, optical illusions, like the vase and the two face, uh, the two faces. Do you see the vase or do you see the two faces? And that, you know, you know what the optical illusion I'm talking about, Michelle? Do you know? What yeah, I do. I yeah. Do. And so that this is a, basically what she's saying is look at literature in that way. Like, are you looking at at the vase or are you looking at the two faces? Because the story is still there. What do you see in the unwritten parts of the books? And I thought that was a fascinating concept. Um, it makes me want to sort of, I mean, I don't necessarily want to revisit too much of the canon of, of American literature, but I think, no offense, canon writers, well, maybe a little bit of offense, um, but I, but it made me want to sort of look at it in that way. What is, what are the invisible parts? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, now I did, and I thought I highlighted because I, I was really into the canons and, um. I think I have, I mean, I can, I can give you some of it. So it's basically if you we start if you're on page like 140. So I'll just maybe do the first um, the first sort of page, which not to I don't want to bore people at home, but I want to give you a sense of what we're talking about. 
So this is what she says. I have been thinking for some time now about the validity or vulnerability of a certain set of assumptions conventionally accepted among literary historians and critics and circulated as knowledge. This knowledge holds that traditional, canonical American literature is free of, unformed by, and unshaped by the 400-year-old presence of first Africans and then African Americans in the United States. It assumes that this presence, which shaped the body politic, the constitution, and the entire history of the culture, has had no significant place or consequence in the origin and development of that culture's literature. Moreover, it assumes that the characteristics of our national literature emanate from a particular Americanness that is separate from and unaccountable to this presence. There seems to be a more or less tacit agreement among literary scholars that because American literature has been clearly the preserve of white male views, genius, and power, those views, genius, and power are removed from and without relationship to the presence of Black people in the United States, a population that antedated every American writer of renown and was perhaps the most furtively radical impinging force on the country's literature. So we could go, I mean, I could just read this book, but because <laughs> it's so interesting, mean, it's, it's unparaphrasable because it's so deep. Each line is so deep, but right. that was really this for me as a, as a writer, as a reader, and for us in the work that we do, which is, I mean, especially this series, right? It's literature, it's book based and thinking about what is in those un, um, what do we see in the, in the quote unquote negative space, the unwritten parts, what's, what's visible there if we look for it. The um, so you know, I, I told you that that I'm reading it with a different eye, so to help me to understand or to unpack how I show up in the world. And so, what struck I mean, really struck me was the um tribute to Martin Luther King Jr. and it's a page and a half, so bear with me. It okay. says pursuing the recollections of several people for um, projects he is engaged in. Martin Luther King III recently asked me for my thoughts on his father. And one of his questions was predictable, designed to elicit some subjective response. He said, if you were having a conversation with my father, what would you like to ask him? And for some wholly unaccountable reason, my heart skipped and I fairly keened into the telephone. Oh. I hope he is not disappointed. Do you think he's disappointed? There must be something here to please him. Well, I calmed my voice to disguise what was becoming obvious to me. What that what I really meant was I hope he's not disappointed in me. Mm -hmm. I went on to frame a question that I would like to put to him. And I set aside my thoughts about the current state of affairs for the dispossessed. Some wins but some big time losses, some vaulting leaps, but much slow sinking into, but much slow sinking into muddy despair. But all the while I was wondering, would he be disappointed in me? And it was odd because I never met Reverend King. My memory of him is print bound, electronic through the narratives of other people. Yet I felt this personal responsibility to him he did that to people. I realized later that I was res responding to something other and more durable than the com complex personhood of King. Not to the preacher he was or the scholar he was or the vulnerable hu human being, not to the political strategist, the orator, the brilliant risk-taking activist, but I was responding to his mission, his, as he coined it, an audacious faith his expectation of transforming a pending cosmic elegy into a psalm of brotherhood, his confidence that we were finer than we thought, that there were moral grounds we would not abandon, lines of civil behavior we simply would not cross, that there were things we would gladly give up for the public good, that a comfortable life resting on the shoulders of other people's mystery, misery was an abomination this country, especially among all nations, found offensive. I know the world is better, finer, because he lived in it. My anxiety was personal. Was I any better? Mm -hmm. Because I have lived in a world that is 
imaginary? Would he be disappointed in me? The answer is an important, but the question really is, and that is the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. He made the act of assuming personal responsibility for alleviating social harm ordinary, habitual and irresistible. My tribute to him is the profound gratitude I feel for the gift that his life truly was. And so that was, again, it made me think two things. Would he be disappointed in me so many generations later? And um, how am I showing up for everyone else? Mm -hmm. um, and when I meet people, not just Dr. King, are they disappointed in me? Because I didn't show up for them um, the way they expected me to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, what, what does, and, and should I even be worried about whether I showed up the way people expected me to? Because some people are expecting me to show up acting real crazy. But um, when I say, you know, I, I think most people expect you to show up with a heart of empathy, mm -hmm. um, with compassion, um, acceptance, um, understanding that we all have value. Um, but I know I probably miss the mark sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so in this self-regard, um, do I offer myself grace when I mess up? That's number one. Do I po apologize when I know I've messed up? And am I making a difference to the people I meet? And mm -hmm. so I am constantly here lately. That's really where I am. Um, it is, how am I showing up? Mm -hmm. And when I think of the backs of the people that I stand on, um, those who came before me and who fought a much harder fight than I've ever had to fight, would they be disappointed? Mm -hmm. And how am I showing up for them? So, you know, I'm emotional, so I'm going to stop talking now. <laughs> um, mm. But it is, I just want to make a difference. I want to make a difference. And I think this is one of the things that we talk about and we've talked about, but I see it in my work and we have a youth leadership Academy, which is wonderful. We get to work with these amazing young people. And one of the questions, you know, it's one of the big ideas is, is, you know, what does it mean to be a leader and, and how, how do we impact others? And, and I think as you're speaking, I'm hearing two things. So one is the big ways. And we can think of somebody like Martin Luther King Jr. And Toni Morrison who impact people in these, huge ways and i it reminds me of something i heard oprah say many 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 years ago and she said you know, to make a difference in the life that you have and she was saying not all of us have 14 million dollars so you make a difference in the life that you have and i think as you're talking and like are we are we showing up for others and i think about sometimes at least for me um you know i have a very small life right and it's not um i'm not a best-selling author i'm not even i don't have a published book you know i i um i'm not famous i don't have lots of money you know the the i'm not martin luther king jr and so sometimes making a difference if i think about it in those big ways that's beyond anything i can ever do i'm never gonna be i can't ever do that but when i think about it in in this idea of like, what does it mean to show up for others? And is it, is it as simple as how do I respond to, so, you know, you said something about, about recognizing someone's humanity. I can't remember your exact language. I'm sorry about that, but it was to do with just seeing, you know, seeing somebody and approaching people with empathy. And so to what extent can I do that in my small little life mm -hmm. that, you know, when I'm at the grocery store or when I'm at work or when I'm, um, in the before times, when I saw, when I saw people on the street, you know, um, you know, what, with what kindness or openness or smile or warmth or grace um, that I extend to others in, in small ways. And I think for me, when I'm able to see 
the what I'm able to believe that the small things um, have impact, that is when I feel that I have power, that I actually can change the world and that we all can, like we can all be this little tiny pebble. Like my little ripples from my little pebble are, are minuscule and they, they disappear quickly, but they're still there. Uh-huh. And so to, tr- to, for all of us to recognize that power, like our, our little ripples may be small, but they, the, but they're there. And that is such a, um, I just feel like once we realize that and accept that, then our human power is infinite. And I don't, did, did you feel that as you were really, like, as this part that you're talking about and, and, you know, it's checking with yourself. Do you feel like your own power? Mm-hmm. I, um, so I know that um, each of us holds power. And uh, much of it comes from where our privileges lie. And um, I think I've shared on this program in the past that um, I've never realized, I've never um, entered a room thinking as an African-American woman that I had a place of power. Mm. Um, I've looked at that differently now. Um, and I look at all my places of privilege mm-hmm. and I recognize that my places of privilege um, create the power and it's what you do with that power in showing up in the world with your privilege, but understanding that your privilege does not give you permission mm-hmm. to not let other people's power shine. Everybody holds some power. And, you know, if all of us just worked on what our power is for good, you know, um, as a, who is it? Um, use your, I'm going to use my powers for good to be a force in this world. <laughs> but it's, you know, in reading this, like especially the um, question about Dr. King, um, I do recognize that privilege and recognize that power. And I recognize um, that my power can help lift somebody else up. It is also that um, it's that power that um will give me uh courage to um speak up for myself but also um advocate for others and um in a way that some others may not be able to do so and so um yeah i I do recognize that it is really really hard some days though Mm -hmm. um, to show up and know that you have power to know that you have value to know that you can make a difference um and to always fight that fight um and i mean sometimes your power is just your smile you know you enter a room and you smile and it could make a difference and um where someone may have been thinking okay here comes this woman and she's going to be um you know she's going to be mad with the world um and then you smile and it changes the room Mm -hmm. um so yeah i mean and there were a number even with um oh shucks there was the eulogy to um for uh, was it James Baldwin? Who was it? Yeah, he is. Um, where she says, and this isn't even about her necessarily. Um, this was his eulogy, and she's talking about him. And she says, um, she's she's saying the difficulty is your life refuses summation, which I think that's good. Um, nobody's life should be summarized (laughs) and um it says it always did and invites contemplation instead like many of us left here i thought i knew you 
And then she says, now I discovered that in your company, it is myself I know. And so I started thinking, what does that mean? Um, and I think something that we don't pay attention to enough is that when we are in the company of others, we don't pay attention to ourselves enough. What's my reaction to something someone just said? Mm -hmm. um, what's going on with me internally based on what they said? Why am I um, having this reaction to what was just said? Why am I afraid of the people walking down the street? Um, the But the only, I mean, so you, you, you're in this person's company and the only person you really know is yourself so, um but i think many of us are really afraid to get to know who we really are mm -hmm. and i think this book because I, I think that she was really vulnerable in this book i think um this is unlike her fiction um where all of her characters experience some trauma but i think in this book she was completely who she was in an African-American woman. And one of the things that she refers to writing is her art. Mm -hmm. So as an artist and showing up in this world of art as a African-American woman. Um, and, and I think she just showed us a tiny window just a teeny tiny window of who she really is. I mean, these are her thoughts. I mean, this is selected essays and speeches. This is not um, her fiction. Um, this is her meditation. I mean, so it's, I just, I'm, I'm actually going to buy the book, um, the, um, cause I want to make notes in it. Um, and cause it, it really did impact me in a way that um, I'm going to say it, it helped with the learning that I had already done in my course. Yeah, as, as you were talking just now about this idea of, of recognizing what's going on with us. So, mm -hmm. so in my, in my life before coming to the United States, I was a family mediator for the government. And, um, in order to do that work, you have to take like tons and tons and tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of education and training. Um, and one of the, you know, do you take these courses, you take courses on mediation, negotiation and conflict resolution and dealing with anger. And one of the, really the purpose of this course dealing with anger is recognizing yourself. So when somebody comes in and they're, they're, so it's too like, how do you experience something that is directed at you? And also how do you experience it when, when it's happening like when you're feeling like, you know, what are your triggers? What are the physical sensations in your body that you may feel um, as you're getting elevated or, or getting upset? And what are the physical sensations you feel in your body when somebody is upset at you? And how do you deal with those? And using sort of um, physical grounding exercises. So like maybe maybe you you touch the seam of your pant leg or something like to, to sort of phys physically ground yourself in those moments. Mm -hmm. um, and it also, your comments also made me think of Pema Chodron, who's this uh, wonderful Buddhist writer. And she has this, uh, one of the opening pages of one of her books, which I can't remember, you start where you are, but uh, she talks about if someone shoots an arrow into your heart, you would be much better served to pay attention to the arrow rather than yelling at the person who fired it. And as you're speaking, it, made, it, it really struck me as that, is that if we can watch our own, you know, yelling at the person who fired the arrow is not going to do us any good, but paying attention to, oh, I have a wound there. Oh, okay. I didn't, I didn't know that that was a, a trigger for me or a sensitive area. And so what, how do I, so first of all, I need to be kind to this part of myself. And also what do I do in this moment, um, in this situation with this other person um, that is hopeful and helpful. And I think that that's a lot of the de-escalation. And, and as you're talking, it's funny to me, I had never thought of it before now, how de-escalation and conflict resolution is not just about de-escalation, it's also relationship building and the benefit of relationship building. And I had never, until like until you were speaking, had I seen 
um, the connection between those. I had seen conflict resolution as maybe like a way to get to relationship building, but um, I hadn't seen it as itself being, you know, a way to um, to build relationship. Um, so I, have to, I have to think about that now because that, that might be a major breakthrough, Michelle. <laughs> Stay tuned for Michelle's and I upcoming academic article about <laughs> conflict resolution <laughs> as relationship building. Um, <laughs> we actually have, I mean, I'm sorry to break it up, but we have some questions and I just wanted to address them because our wonderful friend, Ms. Vivian, library's favorite, is the library allowed to have a favorite? I don't work for the library, so I'm going to say Ms. Vivian is the library's favorite. And she, um, she we love has, every single one of our customers. Our, <laughs> Everyone is their favorite. And Miss Vivian would like to know, um, what can you tell us more? And I'm curious about this too, more about the banning of Toni Morrison's books. So, you know, really, um, I think, let's see, um, some were banned because of homosexual relationships. Some were banned for, um, just strong language, some um, bluest eyes, the rape that occurs. So things that people are aware of, but I guess um, because of who these characters are, um, they don't want, it's, it's sort of like um, even, and, and this is off topic, uh, Mouse was just banned mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um you know it's trying to erase the culture so again cancel culture um let's see if i can find there was an article um let me see if i can find an article. there was this article that um talked about why some of her books were banned um the but usually it is, uh, Miss Vivian, it is really someone assumed that the book had no value and their poor children would be exposed to something they didn't want them exposed to. Um, so I'm, I'm talking, but I'm also looking. Um, uh, let's see, I know I saw this article. And it kind of states why each one um, was banned. Um, I found one in time. Is that potentially in time? About and the title is yeah, why Toni Morrison maybe. books. Yes, yeah, so why Toni Morrison books are so often the target of book bans. That's in time, and we are going to put a link in the chat i think here in just a moment uh for everybody so you can see that if that's the one you're thinking of michelle it was either time or on um or new york times But what's happening right now for those of you watching at home is I'm that Michelle, sorry. Pam, no, Michelle, no, 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 this is great because Michelle, Pam, who's backstage, and Kyla are all like competitive Googling to try to find the articles fastest. And um, I think, <laughs> I think with three minds at it, we're going to get it. Yeah. Watch my dad come in within the chat. Uh, yeah, I saw he said he, um, used Sula. I mean, he read Sula with his um, his high school class and he wanted to know, was it appropriate? And I'm going to say as a high school teacher, if you think it was appropriate, then absolutely. I don't think any book should ever be banned. I think it's how you have the conversation um, mm -hmm. around what's happened in the book. And um, I think it's like reading books that are disturbing or that have things that upset you or that you cry over or that you're gutted by. I think that that is for me, that is how I, to gain empathy. I mean, I think that books are like, I mean, this is not my quote. This is some, so one of the librarians among us, please help me with this quote that is it, is it books or empathy machines or empathy. There's a, there's a quote that is somebody else's about um, what books are as it relates to other understanding others, human experiences. And so I, you know, I love when libraries have banned book weeks and, and there's an opportunity, you know, basically an encouragement to read books that have been banned and, you know, 
maybe even struggle over some of the content or not and be perplexed as to why it's banned. And if you do struggle over the content, I think that that's okay. It's okay to be challenged. Absolutely. And, and, um, and it, you know, the book, I mean, when they, when people go on these rants to ban a book, it usually brings more attention to the book. So it helps the author out really, because then they have greater sales <laughs> of the book, but um, unless it's something that, I mean, it happens after they pass, but um, I'm seeing. Uh, oh, thank you to, Mich uh, to Pam from the library for getting my empathy machine quote. Thank you very much. She got it. Okay. Yeah, I um, I found one from New York Times. A book's banned in the, is, and I put it in the chat. Do you see that? Um, okay. From the New York Times and the. Yeah, I didn't put it in the just for you, Michelle. It's why books ban efforts across spread across the United States from the New York Times. Is okay. that what you're looking for? Um, well, I'm not seeing it in the chat, okay. but no, I, I can put it in the um. Sorry, sorry, everybody. We're just trying to find this article for you. I'm not sure if this is what um what Michelle is looking for, but because Miss Vivian is so faithful, we are working <laughs> seriously. <laughs> But is it, I think I think a way to summarize it would be there's two points of view, Ms. Vivian. I think so. So there's two two answers to the question. So one is why are they banned, and and probably the 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 simplest answer would be because the content of some of 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 a book, a person, not all people, not even like the majority of people, but a person was afraid of, and I would think what what that fear is, is unknown. It may be that they're afraid of um, upsetting people. It, I mean, that's probably the nicest read that I could put to it. It may be that they're afraid of indoctrinating people in a point of view with which they don't uh, agree. Um, or, you know, that they're, that they're, my guess is that most people, most initiatives to ban books, my guess is for the people who are the ban ors, banner, ban ors, Somebody who doesn't have a speech problem, say that for me. Um, that those people, that they probably think that they are protecting people, is my is you know that they're inside their own heads. They think that they're doing it from an element to protect others, is what I think is what they would tell you. Um, that's one answer, and the other answer is that um, people are are banning books really to 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 limit. Um, exposure and limit thought. And so uh, the bluest eye is said to have been banned because it's sexually of its sexually explicit um, language material. It says lots of graphic descriptions and lots of disturbing language and an underlying socialist communist agenda. One complaint simply called it a bad book. So someone's opinion um they it can't can't necessarily find value in the book but they also don't understand that while someone may feel um that this is a bad book someone else it may help someone else heal so um and it, it could be any number of reasons um you know, for the banning of, and I, um, and I know this is not about Morrison, but for Mouse, you know, a lot of people say the Holocaust didn't exist. And so um, mm -hmm. it shouldn't be in schools and shouldn't be in a graphic novel. And so, you know, it, it is just other people's agenda and what they, and especially when it comes to schools, what they believe their children should or should not be exposed to. I really, so I saw that with, and, 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 the, and you said this earlier, that a lot of times when a book is banned, uh, it, it prompts people to want to read it. And so I, I've seen initiatives, whether it's been book bannings in school systems or a, a particular school or something. And the response is that then, you know, somebody sends a classroom teacher, you know, 20 copies of the book. So they have it to give out. And I love these responses, you know, and I think, it, I, I, you know, so as an example, I have not read Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye. But now, after our conversation tonight, it's like knowing that it is getting banned and it, it frequently is up for banning. I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to go read that book now, you know, and I and probably and buy that book now. And, you know, and some of it is to be, um, to counteract 
to, to not give into this, this banning, this um, closing down of ideas. But the other one is, of course, then you're curious. Well, what is it? What is it that you don't want me to read? What is it that is so frightening to you? I find that attractive. I want to know what that is. Um, and I think it is a it probably has the side effect of bringing those works into a lot of, I'm not advocating this. Let me be very clear. And I think that a side effect is that it does bring those books into more people's lives probably. Mm -hmm. um. So I looked up because your, because your dad said he used it with his high school, used Sula with his high school students. I wanted to see, okay, I know it was banned, um, but I also wanted to know, well, why was Sula banned? And it was the exact same thing with sexual themes. Um, it says the bluest eye has consistently landed on the list of most challenged books for sexually explicit material, graphic descriptions, disturbing language, and an underlying socialist communist agenda. So, you know, I, I'm sorry, I can't stop laughing when you say an underlying socialist communist agenda. Like, I feel terrible that I can't keep a straight face, but I find that like I don't understand why. I do not understand why that is causing people to what? Wh okay. <laughs> right. Oh, yes. Um, Joe Martinez, please share that link. Um, I'm reading. It says there's an event of Angela Davis and other black women intellectuals who will be reading from the bluest eye. Please. I want that. Oh, yes. Link. Please, please, please. It was that week. Thank you so much. Yeah. That would be wonderful. We have a great we have a great audience members. There's been lots of chat. So thank you. And for people watching at home, we are open to questions. This is actually technically our question time, but we'll take them anytime. So if you if you are watching and you have any questions for us, you about the book, about life, about things we probably can't answer, please write them in the chat, wherever you're watching, Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter. Um, we'd love to engage with you um, as we're on this journey. Yeah. Um, I was, uh, I avoided, I will say I skipped war talk because I, you know, I don't know what um, Russia's going to do. Okay, so, so that, <laughs> so, okay, well, let's talk. Going with that. So I skipped let's, that all together. Can we talk about um, my existential dread? Probably has nothing to do with war, but um, uh, I take. Okay, you ready? Did well, you well, it? I was going to say, like, speaking of my existential dread, um, I, I, I did underline a lot of parts, but I, I will admit, I mean, I'm finding it's a difficult time, right? Or and we are, we are, you know, mm -hmm. isn't that the old curse, you know, may you live in interesting times? Well, we do live in interesting times. And I know that for a lot of people, and I'm one of them, and I'm assuming almost everybody who is watching and listening tonight are also one of them. It's been a difficult time, you know, between COVID and isolation and, you know, political uh, uncertainties that are beyond our control. Um, you know, one of the things that we know here, you know, Michelle and I get together, almost every month. Uh, we take a few months off here and there, but we're together often. And you know, what brings us together, frankly, is difficult times too, right? What brings us together is trying to find ways uh, in our own hearts and um, with, and to encourage people that we, that we come across to, um, to be a little softer with each other and a little bit more warm, a little bit more welcoming. And frankly, if it wasn't difficult times, we might not need to do that, right? If we all, if everybody got along really great, we wouldn't be we wouldn't be getting to get together every month and, and talk to each other. And um, I know that for me, it is incredibly valuable to be able to have these conversations and to be able to dive into this kind of work. To just think about, to learn from others and to think about how I can go off into the world in a better way. Because for, frankly, for me, it's like a daily, I mean, I have to start fresh every day. And then by like nine, I've screwed it up. So yeah. I start again at 9.30, you know? But I think that this really helps that um, and there was one part, I mean, I'm not going to talk about the war part, but I, I will, um, I was interested by this part about freedom, which again, I hadn't thought about until I, until I, I got to this. So I'm just going to read this very quickly, trying not to take too much time reading out loud. Um, okay. And yet the, so this is on page, if you have this book, it's on page 147. And yet the rights of man and organizing principle upon which the nation was founded was inevitably and especially yoked to Africanism. Its history and origin are permanently allied with another seductive concept, the hierarchy of race. As Orlando Patterson has noted, so this is the, we should not be surprised that the enlightenment could accommodate slavery, 
we should be surprised if it could not. The mm. concept of freedom, this is the concept of freedom did not emerge in a vacuum. Nothing highlighted freedom if it did not, in fact, create it like slavery. And for me, reading this part, this is again when we and it when the discussion of freedom and um, our beliefs around democracy, as we talk about, you know, talking about politics and our values, um, to think about in order for freedom to exist, there had to be a juxtaposition. And in the United States, that that and in the Enlightenment, I mean, the whole, the whole Western um, scientific Enlightenment is is again that that negative space. You know, what is the highlighted? What is the um, shadowed space and what if we turn the lights uh on the faces versus the vase or vice versa what do we see and i thought that was another um i should have known that before i read this part of the book but until i read that part of the i mean when i read it i was like oh of course but i had never thought of it before then okay. was that for you was that something that, that you were very familiar with or was it like i hadn't thought about those the duality of the concept of freedom well not until you said that <laughs> the um that didn't necessarily strike me how what but what it does make me think of um and i am a christian woman so you know when i enter a space i am entering in that way and so this is not to offend anyone um, who may not be christian or religious at all um but you don't know how blessed you are until you've been through some adversity. So you just walk through life if nothing has ever happened to you uh, <laughs> where you were experiencing trouble or trauma or um, something didn't go as well as you had hoped, you would never know. So again, had there not been slavery, you would not know freedom. So um the um i'm gonna have to go back and reread that <laughs> yeah um and, and i'm looking i know i read it, it um because I, I read this part of the book but it didn't strike me that way until you said something the i'm trying to find the um I have so many pieces of paper in this book. I wanted to kind of read um, the parts in college. Help me if you know where it is. Um, the portion in the book. Uh, here we go. The This chapter is um, the foreigner's home. Mm -hmm. And I'm on page 44. And um, oh, mm -hmm. when it talks about um, Theodore Roosevelt in 1901 to Owen Wister, I entirely agree with you that as a race and in the mass, the blacks are altogether inferior to the whites. I suppose I should be ashamed to say that I take the Western view of the Indian. I don't go so far as to think that the only good Indians are the dead Indians, but I believe nine out of 10 out of every 10 are. And I shouldn't like to inquire too closely into the case of the 10. The most vicious cowboy has more moral principle than the average Indian. And these are actual quotes from either letters written or from um, uh, speeches made. Um, and I mean, everything is attacked from religion. Um, someone, the New York Tribune in 1854 wrote, the Chinese are uncivilized, unclean, filthy beyond all conception without any of the higher domestic or social relations lustful and sensual in their dispositions every female is a prostitute of the barest order order and that again new york times new york 
Tribune, 1854. Um, and so when you look back in the history of this country, um, you know, you look at, I mean, there, there's all kinds of, I'm, I'm going to say bondage. So when you think about what has happened in this country, um, not with just slavery, but how we have oppressed, mm -hmm. um, you can't know freedom. And then, the, so unless you've been oppressed and the fact that so many of us are still oppressed, we still aren't experiencing real freedom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we know that we are not enslaved and we don't have any people who've experienced that type of slavery um, in this country, but there are still people in bondage mm -hmm. in some way or another. Um, mm -hmm. And how do we, how do we help them get to a sense of freedom? Right. I mean, and that's the call to action. I was thinking about this as, you know, when we, the subject we're not talking about, which is war and what happens and what happens to the people in a war-torn area. And then like, what is like my personal call to action? Like, do I go there and like try to feed people? Like, what do I do? Like, what do I do? What is my call? Mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and and I'm not joking. Cause, and there are people who, when, who do go to those areas and do feed people and, and who, who die doing that work. And, you know, we, we are not any different the, than those people. They felt called to do it. You know, oh, is yeah. this, is, is now my turn to have that call. And I think it's, whether it's that, or it's, you know, in your community or in your neighborhood or in your country, you know, that there are, maybe there's a state inside this country that could really use your labor and your time and your energy. Maybe there is a, a neighborhood in your own town. Uh, maybe your next door neighbor needs you to come over and bring the muffins. Like, you know, like really like what is our call to action? I think it goes back to really how we started this conversation, Michelle, how you started it, which is how do we go? What do we do in the life that we have to make the world better for others? And so how do we liberate others and liberate them from, you know, in, 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 in the, in the most um, literal sense of that. And also in a figurative sense like or both um and i guess the thing is for me it's just like it's work that just keeps continuing and i keep failing i i keep trying and failing and trying i'm not joking you know it's like every day starts fresh and then by nine o'clock in the morning i mess it up again and I, and I try again and i think that that is my hope for all of us maybe you don't maybe you make it till 9 30 but uh that we all that we all try every morning like freshly um reinvigorated and I, I truly believe that as a collective, we have the power to, to make change. I really do. Yeah. Um, but it, sometimes, Kyla, do you feel like um, you're alone in the fight, though? I mean, I, I, I know in grand scheme of things, we know there are lots of people out there making a difference in this world lots of it lots of people but sometimes it just feels lonely mm -hmm. no i think so i'm lonely and i also sometimes think i'm doing it wrong you know like this is my life's work and in, in one way or another throughout like long before i started my job now and am i doing it wrong like is it does it make any difference? Am I just, do I have the wrong end of the stick? You know, like, what if I've lived my life this way and this has been a goal of my life and it turns out I, I was way off base, you know? And I, 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 I don't say that to be hopeless. Although what a hopeful note to end this on. I know. But, but, I, this I, I, yeah, yeah. but I really do. I mean, I think, I think it's okay to say that that's a question. And I think that one of the reasons that I do this with you, Michelle, and that we talk the way we do is because we know we're not alone. Because I know that by saying that, and it's truthful, I'm telling you this truthfully. Mm -hmm. I also know that there are people listening right now who have that as same feeling. Like I've lived my whole life and what, what, 
contribution have I made and, and did it work? Or here I was thinking I was doing something good and actually I hurt someone's feelings, you know? And I think that this is part of our human condition. And so where I, I guess my concluding thought on that is I, I sometimes do feel alone and I sometimes also think, is it doing, you know, has my life meant anything? And not because I need the kudos, but because the purpose is I, I want to do better. I want to make a positive change. I want to use my powers for good and not for evil. And what if at the end of the day, I just got it all wrong, you know? And I guess where I come down to on that is that I just try day by day. And so, and that may also mean reevaluating and changing and, and shifting and just learning as I go, because that is all any of us can do is learn how we go. I learn as we go. You know? yeah. So Joe Martinez said, um, before the discussion is, he'd like to ask um, how Tony Morrison helps you in your own work. In my experience, when I'm feeling calm, but intellectually engaged, I'll listen to all of her interviews. Um, and, and I will say um, what I, I think I said earlier, um, she makes me reflect on myself and focus inward and makes me ponder how I am showing up in this world. Mm -hmm. um, and am I using all of my gifts and all of my talents to make a difference? Because I, I know that I have these gifts and these talents for a purpose. And am I using them? And it makes me question, not just, not question, because I know what I do. But I am constantly reminding myself of why I do it mm -hmm. and understanding my purpose for the time that I have here on, on, in, on, in this world. Mm -hmm. What about you, Kyla? Well, I, I was thinking actually, as you said that, am I using my gifts and my talents for this world? It made me think of backstage before we began, I was talking to Pam about the movie Encanto and really the message <laughs> Not to give it away. Uh, I know Pam hasn't seen the end yet, but but really there's this, am I using, what are the gifts that I've been given and how am I using them in my community? Mm -hmm. And I think that that, and, and am, I, am I using them in my community? And if not, how can I? And, and, and I ought to, so how can I? And I think that that is a beautiful question. And that is a, also a great question for us to end with because I do see that it is 8.02. So we're a little tiny bit over time. So this is the time of the evening when I start speaking at super high speed and tell you, um, first of all, thank everyone for being with us. What a great group. I love it that you're chatting, you're asking questions, that you come and hang out with us and be in this space with us, which is so valuable to both Michelle and I, and it really is heartening. So thank you everyone for being here. Um, thank you, of course, to Pam, who's doing all the hard work behind the scenes tonight. Thank you very much, Pam, and the Prince Rupert County Royal Library System. And of course, my buddy, Michelle, it's wonderful to see you. Um, I'm so glad we're doing this. And so for those of you at home, you're wondering what we have coming up, um, the Office of Human Rights and the Library together in partnership have so many events in March. It is absolutely crazy. We have um, Jason's, I'm going to get his last name wrong. So I'll just say we're going to talk to the author of History Disrupted on March 2nd. We have another Women in Faith uh, series coming up. And the, the subject of this event is March 31st is Finding Hope in difficult times. So join us, on, you know, we're gonna examine this question on March 31st. We have a legal panel to do with this wonderful book, A Question of Freedom that we've been reading. That's on March 30th. I'm going backwards apparently. Um, and our diversity dialogue for um, March, which is the last Tuesday of the month, but I guess will be the 22nd as well. It is the book, The Lighthouse Effect, How Ordinary People Can Have an Extraordinary Impact on the World. Our April uh, um, diversity dialogue book is The Opposite of Hate, A Field Guide to Repairing Our Humanity, which is this little guy right there. And um, there's a whole bunch more coming up. Please check out our website. You can go to the library's website at pgcmls.info slash events. Unfortunately, our website's a little bit long, but I'm going to give it to you. <laughs> tinyurl.com slash pgcohr events. And there you go. And Pam's put it up on the screen. And so we'd love for you to come check us out, be with uh, be with us for other events. And obviously we'd love to have you back for our next diversity dialogue on in March about the Lighthouse Effect. So again, everybody, thank you so much for everything. Thank you for being with us. It's been wonderful. And Michelle, thank you so much. I love being with you, buddy. Thank you. I love being with you too, Kyla. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night.